Welcome. Hi. Well, my name is Steve Gurney. I'm a founder and publisher of this, uh, this guidebook here, Guide to Retirement Living Source book, that uh, most of you got when you came in. And uh, we're really pleased to have such a good turnout today for this uh, very informative and thought-provoking forum on an issue that's uh, really a deep concern to a lot of us. Um, first, a little bit about me. I'll be serving as moderator today. And uh, the format of this forum is, is that we're going to be passing out business cards, or passing out uh, three by five cards immediately. What we'd like you to do is, while we're talking here with these introductory statements, is write down some questions and concerns that you've got related to elder care in the workplace. And our goal is, is that we want to address every concern that you all have and this will be a great way to sort of get that dialogue started. So when our, uh, our, our featured speakers uh, finish their opening statements, we'll be able to jump right in and create solutions for you to your elder care challenges. In addition to being the publisher of this guide, I also happen to be an alumni of UMBC from the first class of the Erickson School of Aging Studies. So, uh, um, so, something that I'm really proud of and, and something that I uh, that relates to our two featured speakers today is, is that these were my professors in that program. And uh, the first is uh, to uh, the far, to my far right here is Dr. Judah Ranch, who is the dean of the school and is a, an authority on specifically related to mental health uh, issues related to the, um, re related to older adults, Alzheimer's, and issues like that. But a uh, fantastic lecturer and um, really has taken a great leadership role in the school uh, recently. The, the, to his left is uh, the internationally known Dr. Bill Thomas, who is uh, most notably, who is most known for this radical reinvention of the nursing home. Dr. Thomas has created something that we call, that he, he has called greenhouses, which are an alternative to the institutional new nursing homes. But in addition, he's involved in countless other uh, innovative projects related to aging, and so, I don't think that you could be in better hands today in terms of uh, folks that can answer your questions and engage you in a dialogue that will uh, serve to be a solution for your future and your family's future. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn over the mic, I think, to Dr. Thomas, who's gonna make some opening statements. Great. Welcome, everybody. And I, I do have to say, uh, Steve, uh, it's a fantastic uh, resource and expert, and uh, it was a, I had a tremendous pleasure uh, being with him in the classroom, and I think I learned as much from him as uh, he might have learned from me. So, uh, here's what we're doing today. Uh, we want uh, to take advantage of something that's unique on the uh, UMBC campus. Uh, the UMBC campus has the Erickson School, and the Erickson School has a specific approach to aging and organizations that serve uh, older uh, people and their families. And uh, right here on this campus, we have faculty who have uh, training and background in the field of aging and the challenges that come with aging. And we wanted to make sure that we were able to share some of that expertise with our fellow uh, staff and faculty on the campus. So um, we put together this approach of using the note cards because we really want to encourage you to write down what's on your mind. And some of the things that are on your mind are kind of tough things that um, are challenging. And there, there's some people who'd be willing to stand right up in a group and spill the beans, and other people would be a little shy about that. So the note cards enable you to be really direct and really blunt about what's on your mind. And it offers us the best chance to give you um, the best guidance and point you toward the best resources we can. If you came here today, if you broke out of your normal daily work routine and showed up here, you've got something on your mind. <laughs> and uh, that's what we're here to, uh, to deal with. And um, say one last thing. My background, as, as Steve mentioned, is really in kind of reforming the healthcare system. But my training is in medicine. I'm uh, an MD and uh, a, a double board 
board certification in family medicine and geriatrics. So uh, you sort of have, uh, in, from that point of view, a uh, physician and a psychotherapist. Don't we all need that? I think every day we should spend the <laughs> afternoon with a doctor and a psychotherapist. It would be good. Uh, and um, I just say that uh, the Erickson School is so lucky to have Dr. Ronchez Dean. Thank you. And uh, he's an extraordinary uh, friend and mentor of mine. So, Dr. Ronchez. Thank you. Well, I think I'll quit while I'm ahead. Um, <laughs> thank you. It, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, one of my goals has been to make us more and more part of UMBC. And one of our challenges is, is geographic. We're over there in the southern suburbs, you know. Uh, and people don't go there unless they're lost or now unless they want to go to Subway. Uh, go a little further down that road, and there we are at the, at the very end. And if you get lost again, uh, the, the 5525 building has a very good cafe, so you'll never starve to death on Research Park Drive anymore. Um, <clears throat> as, as Bill mentioned, uh, we have been in the world of practice for many, many years. Uh, I spent 35 years in, in, in clinical practice in aging before I came uh, to the university uh, and uh, worked with many, many families uh, who were going through issues about their own aging, uh, the aging of their relatives and the care challenges that, that were presented. Um, and, and Bill, of course, has taken care of, of uh, elders and has had to work with families to help to, to build care systems that work. Uh, and this morning, and, and, and Steve is, is sort of our, our go-to practical solutions guy, because when we talked about doing this, I said, you know, we need somebody who knows where things are in this community, and, and Steve is really the, the, the best person I know to answer those questions. But this morning, uh, Bill and I did a, a radio show, and uh, it was a call-in show about siblings and, and, and family dynamics and, and caring for elders. And it opened up a lot of very interesting topics. So I just want to sort of introduce one thought for you, because this may give you some freedom to talk about some things. Whenever you're dealing with the aging of your parent, you are dealing with a new family situation. Think about what used to happen before and how you could go about your life. And say, well, I'll call on Sunday and see how things are going. Well, when an elder gets into a, a health crisis or is having trouble making it on their own, old scripts begin to be taken out of the closet. And you begin to deal with people who you thought you knew. They are your siblings. And sometimes some very odd people show up. <laughs> uh, what we want you to understand is that your family isn't alone in having that kind of difficult adjustment to the aging of, of, of your parent. This is a very, very tough transition for many families. And one of the reasons it's tough is that we're not taught to think about it. We are more in reaction mode than we are in planning mode. And we'll, we can get into why that is. I don't want to turn this into an academic discussion. But suffice it to say that we're all kind of new at this as a society. So the fact that you came here is really very helpful because A, it gives us a chance to know what people who are dealing with it are really thinking. And B, we can share with you what we've learned uh, over the years to um, try to give you some directions. I don't know that we'll answer every question that you have, but we'll at least try to give you some new ways to think about things. Okay? So I'm going to turn it back over to Steve. And we've, ah, we've, we've, got a we've, we've got heard a bunch. from the audience. It's already Great. looking right. good. Good, good. Okay, so um, this is a, um, this is the Judah pile, and this is the Bill pile. <laughs> oh, okay, great. I'm just gonna now, what you, what you need to know is that there is no pile that is exclusive to either one right. of us. Right, as you'll quickly you'll see. see. <laughs> and if, you, uh, if, if you're working on your card and you have another question, don't, and, and also, if you want to just pop up and ask a question, by all means, that would be great. Yeah, we have a microphone right there. Okay, great. Okay, so let's, uh, I've got two piles here, so I'm going to start on the first one. A uh, 60-year-old only child with an 85-year-old young mother living with me. So that's a that's, comment. That's the comment. What's the question? Well, l <laughs> let me, yeah. It, here's, one, here's one thing. That represents the future. 
You know, we, we have a, we carry around with us a vision of old age that has some mystical, traditional ideas about how, you know, there's all these daughters and they all are living close by and they're all there and we all have dinner at, uh, at grandma's house. You know what? For a lot of people, it's not like that. So one of the most important things you can do is recognize that that statement, you know, 60-year-old, only child, 85-year-old parent, that's the future. And um, we need to have, we need to have, that's you. Yeah, so, so what, what this means is a couple of things. Because you, there isn't a large family network, you're into a situation where caregiving, such as it is, is a one-on-one -on -one game. And one of the things Judah and I really emphasize is that we need to expand our concept of caregiving so that it's, it includes a web of people or a group of people, not just one person. So elders have to understand that really to be supported, they, there need to be more than just one person involved. And also caregivers need to understand you don't have a red cape you don't have a big S on your chest. You're not superwoman or superman, that you're a mortal human, and there are some certain amount you can do, and you can't do more than that. And you have to acknowledge that. So both sides need to acknowledge this. And um, I, I, it can be very difficult. But starting with a reality basis and not mm -hmm. with a hazy nostalgia is a good, good place to start. Yeah, let me pick up on that. Um, as we grow up, we enter into agreements with our parents that we never knew we entered into. In the psychology jargon, it's called a covert contract. And you never know that the contract is there until you get dinged for violating it. I thought you would. Weren't you going to? I did this for my mother. Okay, those are kind of how you know that you've been busted for, for not... <laughs> fulfilling this covert contract. Um, and we have that kind of covert arrangement with our parents. You will always take care of me. You will always be there for me. You will be the person you were when I was nine. Okay, so one thing that happens, um, and I'm sort of gonna do a little fantasy thing away from the demography that you gave us, which is your age and your mom's age, and who's living with whom. We have to say, all right, so what's happening in the relationship that's continuing good stuff, that's continuing bad stuff, that's introducing new good stuff, and that's introducing new bad stuff. So if you do a two by two table in your head, you're gonna wanna say, where do I have to pay attention first? And probably you, your attention is gonna be drawn most acutely to the new bad stuff part of the graph, because that's what's gonna get you mobilized. Um, what I encourage families to do is to say, where am I conforming to a covert contract that I didn't sign? Where is there an expectation that nobody talked about, that I should be doing this for my mother, and I'm afraid to talk about it because I don't want to upset her? Um, I, I don't advocate that people should go home and upset their moms. But I think part of this reality that, that Bill's talking about is we have to have emotionally difficult conversations with, with each other, with our parents, because that's the only way we're going to get through to get back into the new things that we do well part of, of our graph, of, of, our, of our arrangement. Um, and I think it's very good to say, you know what? I don't know how to do this. I've never had to do this before. Let's talk about how you expect for me to do it. And then uh, what that may do is that may liberate the parent to say, well, I thought you thought, or I thought you wanted to, or I whatever. So then you can sort of get into what, what's, what's clear and what's overt and what's negotiable. And then it, it gets to, to Bill's point. You can't, none of us can be everything to everybody. And I think it's important to be able to say, I wish I could do that. I can't but I can do all the rest of this stuff, okay? But often we kick ourselves in the rear end so vigorously for not being able to live up to this ideal image 
of what we're supposed to be as caregivers to our parents. It is very tough to be a caregiver to your parent. It's very tough to be a housemate of your parent very often. You know, you've got your life, they've got their life. When they come back into your house, whose rules prevail? <laughs> come in by 11 o'clock. What are you talking about? I'm 60 years old. <laughs> or I was telling Bill and Caven this. Um, when I, when my, I disagree with my father, who was 83 at the time, uh, and I was already established as a professional, and I said, I'd like you to go get the following kind of evaluation to see why your memory's impaired. He said to me, what do you know? <laughs> okay, so that's just sort of an opener. Well, if that's the first question, uh, man, let me tell you, I've just scanned all the questions. <laughs> These are awesome. I mean, that was a statement, okay? So we're going we're gonna to really get a lot of uh, good information here. Before I, I'm going to do two questions, but I just kind of had this uh, flashback from when I was sitting in the classroom in the Erickson School, and probably the most significant thing I learned when I was at UMBC was from these two guys, and it's the concept of take a complex problem, turn it upside down, and look at it through a different lens, because we're so emotionally tied to these types of things, you got to remove yourself to make rational decisions. So you sort of threw up, threw, up, threw, up, threw out something <laughs> related to being a child. And I, I got a question, how many of you have kids in the room? Okay, well, so we call it parenting, but it's caregiving, it's the same thing. Y you know, so what I do a lot of times is I think about, so like workplace issues, y you know, which is what we're talking mm -hmm. about today. It's sort of like six times a year, I'm taking my two little kids into the office because I don't have any, a caregiver to take care of them. And they disrupt the whole apple cart. I mean, they're running around, all my staff stops working, things of that nature. Never in my 20 year career have I seen somebody bring their elderly parent into our office. But what's the matter with that? The, the elderly parent would actually be more productive in the office, <laughs> okay? Instead, we sort of, it's common knowledge that you can bring your kid in when you don't have a babysitter. And th this sort of technique that was introduced to me in, in their classroom, is just incredibly invaluable. It's sort of like when you start saying things like, this is what an older person does, this is an el you know, the elder, what have you, just replace it with anything. Replace it with kid, replace it with African American, replace it with Asian. And you're gonna start making more clear, less segregated, less, you know, um, sort of biased decisions. So that's why, okay, I'm gonna shut up now because we're never gonna get through it. But I'm gonna read two questions here because this is a work place seminar. The first one's great. How do I clear my mind enough to focus on work when I'm, when I'm at work? Great one for Judah. But the follow-up to that one, and this one, we all hear this on a regular basis, how do I convince my mom to consider assisted living as a healthier alternative to deteriorating at home? So um, I'll throw that to the panel, uh, you know. You want to do the focus? Okay. I, I, I know what he'll say. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say? Um, How do I clear my the, mind? The reason people obsess about things is to keep from doing something. Okay, obsessing about something, ruminating over and over and over again, is a defense against impulsive action. So think about what would I impulsively, what am I impulsively trying not to, what, what impulse am I trying not to follow? Okay, now if you're worried about mom being at home, you, you may want to sort of get a positive scenario in your head as opposed to a disastrous scenario in your head, which is probably why you're worrying. And to basically say to the, the, the parent living at home or wherever they are, um, let, tell me about what your day is going to be like so that you're not just dealing with your imagination. We tend to fill gaps of, of information with emotion. And if we're feeling at all guilty, that emotion tends to be worry and fear and anxiety. So one thing I would do is to say, you know, let me create a positive scenario about what my, my relative is doing. Um, the other thing I would say is, is dig one level deeper and say, why do I worry so much about this? What, what are the expectations that have been unsaid that I carry with me? 
why did I make a decision to continue working when the objective evidence was that was fine? There was, there's no need for me to be home all the time. What am I worried about? And if I'm worried about the what if, right, um, I think you have to do an appraisal and say what are the, what are the real dangers versus the imagined dangers that, that might exist. I would also say that if the person is incapable of being alone without constant worry, this sort of transitions to your second question, then, then maybe that's not a great arrangement. Maybe some other kind of, of arrangement needs to be sought out so that the person can be doing something where you know they're safe, where you know they're having a good time, where you know they are exercising their mind and body, which will keep them functionally better. Uh, because you can't, again, live, staying at your house while you're at work and doing nothing is not a great quality of life for a lot of people. Did you want to pick up on something? I'll pick up. Um, the, 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 uh, talking about the transition, one of the pieces of our cultural, the, the, the common American culture, is um, there's a belief generally held that staying in one's own home rep represents the apex of aging the perfection of aging, and that any move out of one's own primary dwelling represents failure. Now, not just failure, moral failure. So the idea is that if you age in place, you're successful. If you move to another setting, you have failed. Now, hold on a minute. I just going to tell you, one of the things I did before coming to UMBC is I ran a medical practice. And as part of our group medical practice, we had a contract with the county where we did home visits for adult protective services for older people. Woohoo, baby! I could show you some aging in place that wasn't e not, not even within a mile of being healthy or happy or good. In other words, the myth says aging in place is always the best no matter what, always, forever, everywhere. The reality is you can be living at home and not be safe and be lonely and be bored and feeling helpless. All of those things can be happening to you living in your own home. So one of the things to get on the table when you talk about an older relative leaving a, a family home and moving to another environment is you have to defuse the moral failure bomb because that's what people are afraid of setting off. That if I leave the house, oh, this assisted living's nice and pretty, but if I leave, I'm on the down escalator, baby, and you know where it ends up. And if I stay in the house, we can pretend like nothing's changing. So part of the conversation here has to do with surfacing this cultural ideal and pointing out that it's really not very ideal. I, I you know, just let me take nursing homes just for a, a quick concluding example. Uh, you survey Americans about nursing homes and they'll tell you they're, they're not their favorite institution. But I've taken care of lots of people who've moved into a nursing home from living at home and been delightfully happy. Why? because all of a sudden they were surrounded by people and things were happening and they had new relationships and people were involved with them. And when they were at home, they waited for the Meals on Wheels lady to come and that was it. So this is something I'm, I'm pointing out that um, part, of, part of the resistance that comes from saying, I, I don't want to move to assisted living is the idea that it's equivalent to failure and one of the ways to approach that is to point out that it actually is not a failure and can lead to a better quality of life. And this is a great segue to another question. Just so you know, probably five or six of you asked that same question. You know, how do I, how do I deal with a mom that, want, that doesn't want to, uh, that wants to stay at home and not make the transition? Steve, can I just make one more comment before you sure. leave that? Check out the possibility that mom doesn't want to go to assisted living because she thinks that you don't want her to go to assisted living, as opposed to she really doesn't want to go to assisted living. So she knows, doesn't want to break your heart by saying, you know, you've taken really good care of me, but it's time to move on. I'm really, you know, squashing your life, and I'm not having a good time here. 
because mom doesn't want you to be hurt after all that you've done. And this is something we deal with all the time about what's driving the conversation. And the conversation is often driven by people's view of your view of them, right. how they think you see them. And this goes back to the covert agreement and trying to pull stuff out of the dark or the shadows and up into the light where you can actually talk about them. Right. And it's not going to be a one conversation event. Sorry, Steve, go ahead. No, that's great. And uh, once again, now I've got my editorial opinion here is, is that what Judah just said is uh, that you don't, you know, your view of what assisted living is. And here's the question that I've got for everyone. Would any of you move into an assisted living residence today and live there as your, as your own residence? Yes. You would? Yes. Okay. Why, why aren't you making the move right now? I'm working right now. I don't, I don't need to be there right now. Mm -hmm. But I visited assisted living facilities, and I think they're marvelous. Yeah. And when my husband and I retire, that will be the kind of situation that we'll investigate. Well, well, we no longer want to maintain a big home with CCL, the yard. Here's mm -hmm. the challenge that I'm going to sort of throw out. Is the day that all of us who are working 40 hours a week mm -hmm. are living in the same home that is taking care of people who need a little bit of assistance? Like, if you're not ready yet because you say you're working and you don't need that assistance. Right. But if we can, if when, when these homes become homes for everyone, not just people over a certain age or with physical mm -hmm. limitations, then mom is going to be more open to less you know, stigma th th that stigma and i sort of speak from experience this year I, I actually moved in and lived in four different residences as as a resident for a temporary period of time and this stigma weighs on the shoulders of everyone in these communities you go to the grocery store you know with the gang and you're in the checkout line and it's sort of like oh you guys are over at shady acres oh yeah i drive by that place y you know it's sort of it's almost like a prison in a way in that it's a place that you know where it's at but you're not going to go visit there and so we need to be more engaged in in our on our approach to these environments um, but anyway next question mom is in a nursing home dementia care unit how can I ensure she is getting good care mm -hmm. that they are following her care plan while I'm while I'm working? Um, I've been a medical director of a nursing okay. home for a long time, and, and uh, Judy's done a lot of work there too. Just say one thing: if you're asking that question, you're already in a very very strong position. Okay, you 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 have uh, the, the the language in the question reflects an understanding of how things are done and uh, you know what the pressure points are that's a great question you're the whoever asked the question you're the kind of family member i love to deal with and i'll tell you why eyeballs equal quality um, family members friends you know ministers visitors who are in and out of environments where elders are living and being cared for all, all of that improves quality. So, and you're actually, if you're engaged in that way, you're improving quality for the person across the hall. Um, the worst environment, care environment I ever worked in was a, uh, a county home that was uh, the residence for about 160 people who'd been moved en masse out of a state hospital into a, uh, old TB sanitarium and um, they had no no one had any family and so I had all this all these frail elders and no family and I realized when I was working there that the families make an enormous difference just being present is a helpful reminder to the staff of your mom's or dad's humanity and of their uniqueness and of their, their, their the fact that they're special beloved human beings. So that's the first thing. Second thing I would say is know how to complain well. Mm. Uh, there's two, you, know, you can complain poorly and you can complain well. Poor complaints are heavy on the emotion, light on the facts. They're all about the complainer's distressed, uh, distress and not much about what's actually wrong with the system. Good complaints are highly specific and are offered with the intention of 
I know that you want good quality here, and I know you want to do your best, and I know you're going to want this information. Because what I observed was not consistent with what you're proposing as your standard of quality. Let me tell you what I saw. Very effective complaint, okay? The, and the more people who can complain effectively like that, the better care everybody gets. I, just to, to pick up on that, um, it's not realistic to think that you can micromanage every minute of the day, right? But what you can do is do what a good supervisor would do in that environment, which would be to say, I would like to be in on the meeting when the goals for my mother's care are being established. And every care plan has to do that by law. And then what you can say is, as the nursing home surveyor would, as the director of nursing would, as the administrator would, are we meeting the goals? Because you'll know whether or not the goals are being met, you know, not by looking at what's happening every day, because there's gonna be some variation, but over time, over a month, two months, three months, you know, are they meeting their goals? Now, if they're not, it raises two possible questions. One is they're setting their goals inappropriately. They are reaching too far or they're not reaching far enough. The second, and, and this is related, <clears throat> they're not reaching the goals because they haven't brought the proper resources to bear on addressing the issues. And I think you have to understand, and this goes for all of you though I'm looking at her, the goals have to be written in English so that you understand what it would look like if the goal were met. Mm -hmm. So if you've got somebody in a special care unit for dementia, you don't want them to say control wandering as a goal. <laughs> That's not a goal. You want them to say first, if they notice that there's wandering, understand why this behavior is taking place. I would prefer they didn't call it wandering either. Um, I always say, th there's a great t-shirt by the way that one of my former staff at the Erickson Company got in, in, a, in a, a, a gift shop in an in a, in a airport. It said, all who wander are not lost. And that is my approach to taking care of people with, with dementia. You may not know where they're going, but they may have a great idea where they're going. It just happens not to be there. <laughs> okay, so you want to say, what's your understanding of the behavior to, to, the, to the team? And you should be invited to all care plan meetings. And talking about workplace issues, by code, they have to do it at a time you can come there. Yeah. Don't let them tell you, well, we only work 10 to 4. You know, the social worker's part-time, too bad. You've got, and you can, you can write a complaint on that. That's not happening. Um, so, you know, make, the, make the, the goals English, make them evident, and make them about the quality of life of the person, not about the quality of life of the staff. Okay, we'll wander three times less, great, so the, the nurse's aide isn't gonna chase her. But what's she gonna be doing when she's not doing this? You want, you want to flip it, this is to Steve's point about what, how we teach, flip it 180 degrees. What should she be doing what would they like her to be doing rather than what shouldn't she be doing? Mm -hmm. You would like her engaged in things that are enjoyable. You would like her engaged in things that remind her of who she is and what her life has been. You would like her engaged in things that honor who she is. They'll treat her like a dementia patient, but really treat her like a person. Uh, you want her with people she likes and she looks comfortable with. How will you know? She's not fearful. She approaches rather than avoids. She sits next to people, she holds their hands, she smiles when she sees people. People ask her things about herself rather than presume she doesn't know anything. So all these are kinds of things, there, there are books you can sort of look at to sort of go through this litany of, of things that I look at when I go in. Um, basically, are they normalizing her life as much as possible rather than pathologizing her life based on her diagnosis? So that's how you're gonna know that they're doing what they ought to be doing. But the first question is, do you agree with what they think they ought to be doing? And that's based on who she is, not on her diagnosis. Okay? So that's a fact-based, th you've just offered sort of a fact-based right. failure to meet what was asserted. This is the plan, this is what we're gonna do. And um, um, I'm just gonna leave the incontinence aside for a minute because we could spend a whole lot of time on that. But, um, but let me just say about the, the incontinence garments. That, they, that they're certain appropriate ones are certain times of day. You observe that this is not being done and you wanna bring that information to the team and they're, you know, they need, you wanna help them be successful in doing that. And you have to be aware too, there's an ombudsman available 
who you can talk to if you're making solid, well-crafted complaints and you're not getting results, mm -hmm. you need to kick it up the chain, you know. But always start with the team because you like to presume that they want to do a good job. Yeah, let me throw in that resource that Bill just uh, spoke about. It's the Ombudsman Program, and it's administered all throughout the country through the Area Agencies on Aging. There's one in every single county in the country. And uh, you can, the phone number, it's in our guide, but 1-800-677-1116 will connect you to any Area Agency on Aging in the country. And through that program, you can get in touch with the Ombudsman so if you're having a dialogue with management of a nursing home, assisted living home care agency, and you want an advocate who's advocating for you and documenting all this stuff, uh, the ombudsman is great. Also, when you're choosing a place for a loved one, you can call the ombudsman and say, hey, what can you tell me about these three places? <laughs> Here, here's, they know a lot. They, they do know a lot. And here's the thing that I always say. It's if a place has had some issues, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, I can't run a business without having issues every day. Bring these up to the management and say, hey, I went to the ombudsman. These are some issues that were brought up. How did you resolve these? And you might get to that. Um, for the next question, I'm again going to throw in just my editorial. And going back to what I learned from Bill and Judah, since there's so many parents in this room, imagine how, how do you deal, how, OK, do you drop your kids off at school and just let them run wild with the teachers and not participate in activities, not join the PTA, not talk to their teachers. You just drop them off and drive off into the wild blue yonder. That's not how our kids get the best education and how we feel the best about the schools that our kids are going. It's getting involved with our kids' school and being a part of that community is where you can raise the bar of the education your kid's getting. What I find in talking to most of my readers is is, is that in elder care, we take the approach of, you know, drop mom off, mom will see you next week. Uh, you're going to love it here because they play bridge and you love playing bridge. Get, get involved because you can take what, what, what your neighbor might say is a horrible nursing home and turn it into the best nursing home in the world. Uh, talk to the caregivers. You know, uh, I got a, a neighbor of mine, she picked up, uh, she found out that this caregiver was taking two buses to get home from work and then going to another job. And she pull, she found out where he lived doing a little incognito, pulled up at the bus stop, said hop in, had a nice cup of coffee, and let me tell you something, it was like her mom was living in the Ritz Carlton because that guy <coughs> had the eyes and ears looking out for her mom. I hate to say that we're in a system like that, but that's the way it is. Well, I think it is, and uh, actually, care is all about relationships. Mm. That's what defines whether it's good or not so good. And you can have a little shaky old building and, uh, and you have great relationships, it's going to be all right. Yeah, just to follow up on that, and, and I'm, I'm still thinking about your, your point and Steve's point. It is crucial that you build relationships with the people who provide care. Not when there's a problem, but from day one so that your entrance into the building is not an abnormal situation. And, and the way you have to sort of handle it psychologically is to not go in guns blazing the first time you go, but basically say, you're admitting my mom, you're admitting all of us. We come with her. And the best compliment you can get from the care team is, she's got a very involved daughter. The worst thing they can say is, her daughter is a pain in the neck. The difference is if you're involved on a regular basis, on a non-emotional basis, and just say, look, it's a fact. I'm here with her. I'm going to be involved. <clears throat> I'm going to ask questions nicely, politely, fact-based, but you're not going to get me not to come here. So learn to live with me because I'll be here as long as my mom is. And that's your right. I, I would say that if you can flex, if you can use you know, some of your time to say, you know what, I'll go in first thing in the morning and then work an hour later. Whatever you can work with with your, you know, supervisor, because I think it's important that you go in at, at different times. Um, the care is not supposed to be different in the evenings and on weekends, though it often is. Um, but you want to just sort of show up, say, hi, I'm here. Um, that's part of your quality of life. 
to enhance your productivity at work. I think you will worry less if you do that than if you say, oh boy, it's, it's Thursday and I can't go until Saturday. Yeah, uh, and one, uh, I have one more thing too, which is for everybody. Ben, what Steve was saying, y your kid's in the play in third grade, Woohoo! later I'm going to the play. You have to visit your mom in the dementia care unit. Oh, I don't know, you know. But actually, both are, both are equal caregiving obligations. They're the same. And, and I would say, Val, if our policies don't, good. <laughs> I have to live with Valerie. Um, if our policies allow it, supervisors, you ought, to, you ought to promote that if you know that that's an issue that, that your, your, your staff is having. Uh, you will get much more productivity at work. The amount of dollars lost to worry are huge. I'm going to give you one solution, and then I'll, I'll get this woman in the tent. Uh, there's, there's a profession called professional geriatric care managers. There's two little solutions that I recommend. Number one, the fr well, actually, the first is cultivate your own quote-unquote volunteer network. I hate the term volunteer, though. <laughs> cultivate a network. So think about the things that your mom or dad might have an interest in. Maybe your dad collected coins. Go out, reach out to a coin collecting uh, club, which I guarantee is not 89% is retirees. And say, hey, my dad loved collecting coins. I'd like you to come to the nursing home and meet him. And what would be great is if amongst your membership, you could come and talk to him about collecting coins during the times of the day that I can never get there. Um, that, and, and that's I'm free. Off. That's free stuff, you know, right there. And then you can plant the seeds, hey, what did you see, this, that, and the other. Now, if you can't cultivate that network, or mom or dad didn't have a hobby, you know, like that, professional geriatric care managers are probably the best, next best choice. These, are, and there's an article in Sourcebook on them, they're social, primarily social work and nursing trained professionals, and families hire these folks to sort of be this objective eyes and ears for their loved ones. A lot of times, care managers come in when siblings are arguing over what's the best thing. Everybody's got these skeletons in the closet and they think mom should be here. They want the, the, the family estate to be, be theirs and they don't want to spend 40,000 a year. So they hire a care manager to objectively make that decision. But where I really like care managers, their work is a weekly visit where mm -hmm. they write up a report on mm -hmm. what happened. And this is great when mom is in California and you're in Baltimore. Um, you can hire a care manager, keep her in California where her friends and family where she's lived her whole life. The care manager gives you this up to date uh, write up. And the great thing is these care managers, they're like rock stars in these, uh, these uh, communities. No one's, gonna, uh, no, no one's gonna mess with Mrs. Smith <laughs> because she's, Mrs. She's the care manager client. So those are two solutions. Can I just follow one, two, two points? I, I think there may be things you can take advantage of very easily that maybe haven't been told to you. Surrogate eyeballs. I like this. <clears throat> there are family councils in nursing homes. Um, you might want to go to their meetings. They usually meet once a month. You might want to join because that's sort of who does the on-site, how's it going stuff. Uh, the second thing is get to know other members, other family members of people who live there um, because they can't divide and conquer as easily. Uh, and now you've got email correspondence, you can have telephone correspondence. What I've seen that works really nicely in, in, a, in a number of facilities is that when I go to visit my mom, I visit your mom mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that doubles the amount of visit without doubling the amount of time. And we now form a little surrogate extended family. And so I've got an eye on things. I won't complain about your mom unless it's really dangerous, but I'll tell you. Um, and, and vice versa. And nursing homes that, that know that they have that network really take a very different approach to care. Because you never know who's watching you. Um, this is a good one here that's also common is how do you how do you approach the subject of imminent death of an aging parent when other siblings do not want to face the reality I guess that's a psychology thing yeah <clears throat> I'll talk about the death part okay he'll talk about death I'll talk about imminent um, 
Denial is a very important defense mechanism. We use denial to keep ourselves from being overwhelmed by emotions that we can't handle. Um, denial may not work to solve a problem, but I think you want to respect the reason that the person has it and not say, look, brother, don't you know, mom, you know, and like really sort of get in their face about it because all you'll do is disorganize them and, and make them worse. Um, people deal with death in all sorts of ways. I think that if they're not accepting it, that's for them and their therapist or them and their minister or them and their doctor. But if they're not accepting it is precluding certain care decisions from being made, then you've got a very different kind of issue. And you may want to, if the person is really not willing to accept it, A, be sympathetic to the fact that they're not. And, and instead of seeing them as a, as, as a blockade, say, wow, he or she's really hurting about this. What can we do to help them deal with it? Second is to say, look, there's some decisions that need to be made. You may not like the idea. You may not be willing to accept the idea. But all the evidence is that mom is really, you know, in, 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 in pretty bad shape and that her death may be, you know, sooner rather than later. Again, don't count on one conversation to sort of, you know, break open the door of, of insight. Um, <clears throat> but it, 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 what's probably stopping the person is a, a feeling of they're going to fall into the abyss of loss and that the loss of this person is going to be devastating to them. And you, you don't want to, you know, make them confront it without any other way to deal with it. And sometimes just by going ahead, if they're not blocking it, they ultimately sort of get on board and they begin to see what's happening. But, um, you, and you need to talk about it. And they may not like it, but they need to hear it. And they need to hear it over and over and over again. But they need to hear it with a sympathetic view to their experience rather than why are you being so obstinate. They're being obstinate because it's going to hurt. And they're not prepared to be hurt. And they don't have any resources to put against this, this hurt that they feel. I mean, it's, if it's their parent. It's their mom who's dying. We all live in fear of that. Okay, in fact, Freud's famous quote when his mother died was he said, now I can die. Okay? That, that there's that sort of feeling of we, we, we do not want to witness this and we do not want our parents to outlive us. Okay? Very good. I, I, before I came to UMBC, I ran a uh, physician practice taking care of older people and our practice concentrated on taking care of the most frail, the most impoverished people uh, of all um, in, in the city where we were practicing. And in a typical year, about 30% of my patients would die. And you can imagine, what, what kind of practice is that like? I mean, what's it like coming home at the end of the day, la da da Virtually every day, some, someone died, okay? Now, one of the benefits of that for me was I got to be with many, 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 many people and their families as they died. I'm going to give you a very kind of a short version of a talk I have given many times to grieving and disturbed and upset families, okay? Let's imagine a situation where someone you love um, has suffered a, 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 a Clearly, life-limiting change, a big stroke, you know, a, 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 you know, a massive development of a, a, a acute illness, and it's very clear that their life is limited. What I emphasize to families is we stand right now together here at, at a decision point. On the one hand, as the doctor, I can give the person you love maximum care, maximum comfort. I can see that their, their, their lips are moist and that they have warm, dry bedding on and that their pain is treated. And I can, I can take care of, of this person you love. Or, as a doctor, I can order that this person have maximum treatment. Okay. Now, maximum treatment does not come with maximum care, I am sorry to say. We are at a decision point. You've got to think about this person you love, and you have to ask, should we provide 
him or her with maximum care or maximum treatment. And then I make it very clear. I am not judgmental. I am coming to you as the people who know this person best, and I will listen to your counsel, and we can go either way. Now, I'll tell you, I've given that talk many, many times. And what it does is it helps relieve an enormous amount of guilt because families wrongly suppose it's either maximum treatment or nothing. And give, yeah, send her to the hospital. What I offer is maximum care or maximum treatment. In all the times I've given that, I've, pretty clearly I would say about 90% of the time the family says we want the person we love to have maximum care. And I say, she's going to get it because we're really good at it. 10% of the time I pick up the phone and I call the ambulance, and they go to the ICU. That's the choice that's made, okay? The, the, the thing that's missing is the idea that if you don't choose maximum intensive treatment, you're choosing nothing. That's wrong, okay? That's the takeaway here. If you ever find yourself in that situation, please recall this conversation, this moment, okay? You can use this to help your friends or other parts of your family to help think this through in a way that's really moral and sensitive and um, gives people a real choice. To follow up, what Bill just illustrated was a way you can have control in a situation where there's virtually none. Okay, the reason that a lot of people opt for treatment is it gives them a feeling of, of being in control, of having done something. What, what Bill just gave you, and it's beautifully, beautifully put, <clears throat> is to be in control of, a, of, a, of a, an option that is probably in the long run better for your loved one but harder for you. Right. So you need care during this period as well. You can't just tough it out. This is a very difficult transition for you if that's what you're dealing with. Um, and it takes time. And in a way, it's kind of interesting that nature made it take time. It's a very difficult concept to grasp that somebody is gone or somebody will be gone. So it takes this kind of agony and rearranging your thinking, not only about the facts of what's going on, but what's happening to your relationship with them that you're witnessing. So the fact that you are having a difficult time means that this is an important relationship that's being taken away from you. That's where you need the support. So to be told, of course this feels terrible. Of course you feel stuck between a rock and a hard place. But if you can make a decision that is a maximum benefit to your loved one, you've done the best thing you can do under the circumstances. So that's why the care of the family is, is such a critical part of good medical practice and unfortunately not often done. Great. Um, Dr. Bill opened the door when he said that he took care of impoverished people for a great question. And I have some thoughts on this. but. Uh, it's how can I afford my parents' care? Mm. And I think the, the, the operative word there is how can I afford my parents' care? I'll, I'll turn mm -hmm. it over to you guys. Well, uh, you know, I do, I, I am uh, privileged to travel around the world um, and I work uh, consulting and teaching in a, in a large number of other countries. And I love my country deeply, but I'll tell you, this is a hard place you live in. Uh, <laughs> if you want to entertain a bunch of Brits or Germans at dinner, all you have to do is tell stories about the American healthcare system because they don't believe it. Okay, that's, that's the fact. The fact is that um, we require many families and elders to make a terrible choice between pauperization and care. In other words, you can get care, but only by becoming impoverished. Mm -hmm. And in the rest of the industrialized world, it, <laughs> they think it's nonsense. But that's, in terms of Medicaid funding for long-term care, that's how it works in the United States. Um, I advocate for, in the United States, um, a, a more sensible approach to long-term care insurance. That, that's good. 
Um, I, do, does, is long-term care insurance offered in any way through? Yes. Okay. It's a good investment. It's a good investment. I'm <coughs> going to get to the immediate situation here, but first, so long-term care insurance um, is one way of, of handling this. The, the second thing is, um, in order to help the person you love get what that person needs, you're going to have to spend time becoming a navigator, an expert navigator. Because there are resources out there and there are possibilities out there and there are programs out there, but they're all scattered like some uh, satanic Easter egg hunt <laughs> where you have to find the stuff and none of it is, e is easy to find. That's why Steve's work and his publication I think is so valuable and important. It gets you on the path to finding these out. You notice how Steve had that phone number right at the top of his head uh, because you direct people there. And you do that every day. <laughs> exactly. So, so, one, so my last point about this, uh, how can you uh, help them afford? Um, uh, I, I think the answer is um, you can do what you can do. Uh, but one of the most valuable contributions you can make to your uh, parents' care is becoming an expert in the system. Maybe not something you wanted to do, but um, that's what's called for. Yeah, just, just to follow up, winning the lottery <laughs> is not an answer to how to pay for your parents' health care. Um, I think that for your parents' generation, the options will be tragically limited. I think for your generation, they may be better, and this is why we teach policy in our program. You've got to affect the policy community because they need to know that this matters to you. And I don't care who you vote for or how often you vote, you've got some sense of leverage in that, in that regard is to say, this is back to what we teach in Aging 100, take your personal trouble and turn into a public issue, or else nothing will happen. Um, we got a, a phone call today from a 29-year-old when we were on this radio program saying that her grandparents are pretty well taken care of, but it's her parents that she's worried about. They've not put money aside. <clears throat> they, sh they don't have you know, long-term care insurance. She worries about what the burden will be on her and her siblings, because her parents really aren't interested in doing this. Uh, they may be thinking about winning the lottery, too, as, as their plan. But it, and it's, it's an uphill battle. So your generation's job is to become expert at what exists in the system, but also to start getting expert at how to make the system work in a way that uh, you're not looking at the, the best of the bad options, but really saying, you know, what are some things that really make sense? And this has not only to do with, treat, with, with, with models, with care models, but with funding, with incentivizing people to put aside money uh, for, for their care when they're older and not have to worry about, about pauperization with a five-year look-back period to go on Medicaid in order to pay for a nursing home. Um, I mean, the policies are now set up, and it's funny that I'm now giving a policy lecture, but are set up to keep money away from you and put them in on, on right. the long-term care provider side. That's the way the policy is. Why? They have better lobbyists than you do. That's the truth. You've got to get out there and you've got to make that word known because it's your care you're talking about. Great. So I was going to follow up with you're here in Baltimore and, you know, we don't have time to activate a lobby in the next six months to deal with this question. And so I'll give you the answer that I usually give to most of the people Good. that call me with this question. And the first thing is, it, why I said, how can I afford my, my parents' care? This is one of the key things that I've seen over the years that has been tragic, is, is that the family starts pooling their assets together and sacrificing their own well-being for, for mom. That's good. I mean, that's your choice. But I tell folks is, even if you're a multimillionaire, Where's the line in the sand? Because no one knows how long this is going to go on, and you could literally go through millions of dollars uh, doing the right thing, but then now you're a burden on your own children. And so have that discussion no matter how wealthy you are and how many resources you are. The second thing is 
use the Erie Agency on Aging. As, as Bill had said, I give that name, I give that phone number out every day, and right when you're starting to get into this, find out everything that mom and dad can qualify <coughs> for. If, if mom's a veteran or dad's a veteran, spouse of a veteran, if they, were, if they belong to any civic associations, uh, nonprofits, call their old employers. See if there are things like that. I also say turn to the churches, is, is that if your mom is or dad is involved in a religious organization, talk to the pastor about the situation. Uh, you'll be amazed at how communities activate, but it is, it, this stuff is not easy and there's no road map because it's customized to that individual's personal history. But I'm a huge advocate of free care. I mean, wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to pay for care? You, you know, I mean, that's the way it works with me and my kids. It's like I call up my parents, my brother, and they babysit my kids, and I don't have to pay $20 an hour for a babysitter at night. This is one of the things that I don't think people exploit to the nth degree, is building a network right. that supports this. And it's like long-term care insurance. It's sort of like, so in my own neighborhood, I, I witnessed mm. this one day where I had an elder who was getting home health care uh, uh, on one side of the street, and no one knew who they were, okay? Then on the other side of the street, I had two stay-at-home moms that are basically, you know, just playing around in their living room all day long with their kids. And, you know, by knocking on some doors in mom and dad's neighborhood, by thinking a little bit outside of the box, you might not have to pay for 40 hours of home care if you can get a couple of stay-at-home moms to stop by and play with the kids in your mom's living room. It's outside the box, it doesn't fit every person, but think about this network. Mm -hmm. There's a website out there that sort of turned me on this way of thinking, it's called Lots of Helping Hands, and it's free. And what it does, it's sort of like a social networking thing. You can sort of throw in your network, and there's like a calendar on there. So if a sister went by and saw that mom needs socks, she can put that on the calendar, and then the next person that goes by will bring new socks, you know, when, when they visit mom. So those are a couple of uh, suggestions there. Let me, um, since this is a workplace uh, conference, let me, uh, uh, let me talk, uh, here's a question, what can employers do to accommodate elder care? Hmm. <laughs> Um, bring your elder to, to work. work. Yeah. <laughs> hey, we got bring your kid to work day. I mean, why don't we have? Well, let, let's. Can, I'm just jumping. Yeah. Play with you that. Know, here's a here's one of the things that uh, Judah and I both uh, rail against is the notion uh, that aging is somehow weird and separate and distinct and apart from the rest of life. So we have this very nice campus here, uh, and we were walking across campus earlier and. There's an extraordinarily narrow band of age, uh, if you walk down this thing here. Um, and you know, as a geriatrician, I'm walking around going, where are the elders, you know? So for example, uh, a, a partnership with some of the uh, master's students and graduates out of the Erickson School Program and UMBC to create uh, a day services program that could benefit people who work here on the campus. I mean, that's something that takes time and work and energy, but could be a real benefit. And what I'm saying is, I'm always interested in ways that bring elders into contact with younger people. Um, for quite a, for hundreds of generations, older people and young people were together on an organic basis that nobody ever thought anything about. We now live in an extremely age-segregated society, and it actually takes real work and planning to bring elders and young people together. So I think it might, that, that's one interesting possibility. Uh, and I do, having been involved in projects like this, I do not underestimate the difficulty in making it happen. But if you were to survey the workforce, you might find that there would be quite an unspoken need, mainly because people think that they have to keep the elders away. Should One of my fantasies for the Erickson School is that every major gets a t-shirt and an elder when they declare their major. <laughs> and that the elder is their mentor for their entire undergraduate education. Great. 
and that everything we talk, they come to class, and everything we talk about in class gets reflected. So are you experiencing this? Is this what your life was like? You know, tell me about the Great Depression. Um, it, it will take a lot of work to do this, but I'm determined that that will be something we uniquely do in, in the United States because I, <clears throat> I think there's a, a great resource out there, which is our parents and our grandparents. And I think part of what we do as an innovative school ought to involve some way of, of capturing that. It can be um, electronically if, if there's mobility issues, but certainly there should be face-to-face -face contact. I would love it if there were a place that elders could come and give wisdom, hang out, go to class, use the library, you know, just not, not, not sort of break the system by taxing it, but contribute to it in some way, in a way that we have not heretofore used. And they are living history. And, and our students, not just the, the, the majors necessarily, um, but students ought to know. I mean, one of the reasons we, time for the commercial, one of the reasons that we were so enthusiastic about the school is not just to educate people to go to work in the industry or industries, um, but basically to educate citizens about this world that they're growing up in. Um, and it's fascinating to see on the part of, of our undergraduates who are saying, and this is sort of very funny to me at, at my age, you know, boy, I never really understood old people. Now I really understand my parents. <laughs> <clears throat> How old are your parents? <laughs> 43. <laughs> so, so I think that you know, there's something we could collaborate on, perhaps, yeah. to sort of add value to your lives, to the lives of, of parents, to the lives mm -hmm. of our students, uh, and, and to this community, to say, you know what, we have a resource that nobody else is using. You know, I'm glad Judah brought up the campus and the college because I just realized I, I've given this sort of little words of wisdom, but I've never done it on a college campus. And mm -hmm. frequently I get the question, you're, you're choosing an assisted living, a nursing, one of these places for your mom. Well, how do you tell which one is best? How do you make that decision? And the first thing that I tell folks is, and this addresses the stigma, is mom is not moving into an assisted living, nursing home, retirement community. Pretend that mom is moving in, to, mom is going away to college, okay? That this is a college that mom is going to. And because everybody wanted to go to, away to college, no one except for we've got one person that really wants to go to one of these assisted living uh, communities. So you start off with this sort of positive state of mind. And now, since mm -hmm. you guys are living and breathing this, imagine if all the prospective students for next year were uh, greeted by marketing directors uh, here uh, when they came onto the UMBC campus. How many students do you think would choose this school if it was marketing directors that were talking to them and giving them the tour around the campus, sort of showing them what this place was all about? Colleges have figured out the formula. It's like you have students that make this tour. Now, when I chose my college, and when I think most people chose their college, you sort of set foot on campus. You weren't really listening to what the other student was saying. You just started looking around and saying, I want to party with these people for the next four <laughs> years. Okay. Now, totally irrational decision, way of making a decision. No square footage, no crown molding, no activities yeah. director, none of that evaluation. This is just an irrational decision. And what I say is, and this addresses a few of the questions, is how do I get mom to do this? You gotta get mom to start thinking irrationally. You know, yeah, yeah. But, but meaning the that when you go into this community, with your if mom likes collecting Beanie Babies, you know, have the marketing director find you three other ladies that like collecting Beanie Babies. Now, this expensive decision, every day she doesn't make it, she's missing out trading Beanie Babies for, you know, a day, two days, three days, a week. And, and that can make it a much more positive environment. So I tell folks, it's not the walls that you're buying into, it's the people that live in the walls. And just like sure. there is no college in, on this earth that has the student body that UMBC does. So you can't buy this anywhere else. The, each retirement community and each option that you're choosing, uh, they're exclusive based on the residents that live in that community. So hopefully that'll kind of help you with that. How do you understand that though when the 
first person you meet as a marketing director. No, no. Well, this is just you know my right. ideal world versus yeah, my no, I, yeah. I'm, I'm so, yeah, but so <laughs> let, this let is me. what I say you do is is that basically use the marketing director as your guide. Like so, if you say if you call up and say, hey, I'm interested in this place for mom, let me tell you about her. Okay, boom, boom, boom. And then it's like, when we arrive, I would like you to introduce us to three or four people that have those same types of characteristics. Um, yes, ma'am. We found on, when we picked out assisted living, we were much more comfortable with the places where we didn't have to set up and didn't pay us when they were open. So sure. Just walk in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can walk mm -hmm. around this campus without signing up for the student tour, and I'll probably make a decision on whether I want to go here or not based on that. I'll probably sign up for the student tour so I get a t-shirt or whatever you guys give the, uh, the folks on that. That's, that's can, can I just follow up on your on, good question? In the management world, we talk about push marketing versus pull marketing. Don't, don't go to push marketing. You want them to ask you about your mom, not tell you what they have to offer. That's Steve's point about crown molding. You know, uh, I don't want to know all the features you have on the real estate side. I want to know what, what the lives are that people live here. This is what my mother wants to do. <clears throat> Show me some people who were doing that. I want to see, not only I want to see them doing it, but I want to see how much of a good time they're having. It's, it's Steve's party theory. You know, who do I want to hang around with? Because that's really what's going to make you happiest, is if mom stops calling you because she's too busy. You know, the, the, the biggest sign of, of mental wellness when I was with the Erickson Company was that people were too busy to volunteer to do things. They had too many other things to do. They had over 200 clubs and organizations over at Charlestown. When I was in college, I was too busy to call my parents. Yeah. Uh, you know. That's what you want. <laughs> yeah. That's so the transition. I, I, I would add uh, part of uh, what's happening in the conversation right here is a really important part of a our philosophy on aging, and I just want to make it explicit. Um, Jude has written a lot about st a strength-based approach, and it's certainly behind the work that I've been doing and what Steve's about um, in the Erickson School. The, the idea is that um, the culture frames aging as a down escalator, and you get on, and it just leads to just one terrible place after another. That's the culture's framing of, of aging. And that's why so many people go to really extraordinary lengths to uh, minimize the appearance of age or to uh, deny age is because the cultural narrative is terrible. So part of what we're about is reframing the narrative and using a strength-based approach. So you heard Steve doing this, reframing assisted living as, well, you know, you can't make it at home, so. Um, Reframing that to, this is a place to go and live and experience vibrancy, thriving, within the context of who you are right now. Now, that doesn't change. There's a reality component to aging that cannot be denied. That does not change. What changes is the narrative you build around it. And one of the most effective things, um, I think, you know, I've, I've taken care of a lot of people I think the best medicine that I ever, ever administered, and I did it many times, was visiting people in a nursing home, people bed bound, and just leaning over the bed and looking right at them and saying, you know, you look great today. Dang, you look good. <laughs> and I would be, leave the room, and I had given something better than vitamin B12, <laughs> you know, something better than a pill, I've been able to change the narrative for maybe a day. Dr. Thomas was in. He said I looked great. <laughs> you know, so that's a powerful part of, of changing what the experience is for yourself and for the person, the, the people you love. Yeah, I want to follow up on that. There was a very classic study done over 30 years ago where the experimenters went to a nursing home and they went onto a unit and they said to that unit, we think you can make great choices about what you want to do around here. This is the Langer and Roden study I'm looking at. Randy. Um, and 
we think that you will make great decisions, you'll have a great life here, because you'll take advantage of what there is to have. And what we'd like to do is give you a plant that you can take care of. Right? They went upstairs to another unit and they said, to an equal group of, of elders, <clears throat> um, we will take great care of you. We will see your every need. You will get great care here. We're going to give you a plant that the nurse's aide will water every day. Eighteen months later, the first group had more survivors than the second group. Very powerful study. And the power in the study is if you give people choices, it mobilizes their entire body and spirit and mind. And what, what I'm saying is, I think one takeaway for you is not to assume that you have to make the choices, but to understand the value of the elder being involved or making the choice, and you saying, you know what, I may not be the most comfortable with that, but that's a good choice, because it's your choice. Often they'll be more conservative, by the way, than you will about the kinds of things, but they'll, they'll fight for their right to choose by making some pretty odd choices. Um, so think about that, that, that elders, given the opportunity to make choices, make ones that are in their interest, in their favor. It actually is better for them mentally, better for their brains. Um, and they typically live in a more conservative band of life than we think they're going to. But we deny them the ability to make choices because we think they're going to do some really crazy stuff. And often they'll be like adolescents. You tell them they can't do it, they're going to do it. So you can try that experiment. So I think that the fact of affirming the, the positive aspects of who they are is a very, very powerful message that often gets you out of this bind that you may be in about, you know, how do I pay for my parents' care? How do I put them in a nursing home? How do I, I don't think that's the way to go is what we're telling yeah, you. Yeah, I, I would, if, if I were kind of rewriting all the questions, I might have re reframed them. How will we, how can we? Because that's where I come from, and Judah comes from, the school comes from. You know, we're, I'm in partnership with my mom or my dad. Well, how are we going to? And that helps break this pretty unhealthy cultural narrative that says they're dependent and it's all on you right. and they're resisting and they won't go along with what they're supposed to do. Break that narrative. Well, we're, we're winding down here, and so uh, we'll just make some sort of closing statements. I think that, I think that we'll all be able to hang out for a few minutes and answer some, mm -hmm. uh, some questions. But I wanted to follow up on something. Again, hearing these guys talk, I'm constantly reminded of these lessons that I learned. And this summer, probably one of the most valuable lessons I learned related to aging was at a barbecue, uh, family barbecue, and we've all been at this barbecue before. This woman that we were talking to said, you know, I'm really trying to get in shape because next year is my 70th birthday and I want to hike Yellowstone and Yosemite parks. And everybody in that circle is like, whoa, you're 80, you're, you're 70? You, you know, it's sort of like when somebody tells you how old they are and, you, and so, there's this disconnect, you don't look like you're 70. You know, and we all oohed and awed for a little bit. And then my wife, we were driving home and I said to my wife, because this woman had said this, she had a full head of gray hair. She was a little bit overweight. She wasn't dressed glamorously or anything like that. It's like, I said to my wife, why exactly did you kind of ooh and ah when she said she was 70? And my wife said, you know, it's her eyes. Mm. And I said it was her smile. And this really kind of turned me upside down in, in terms of what is it that makes us gives people spirit. It, is it coloring our hair? Is it the wrinkle? This woman had wrinkles. She had extra weight. She had all this stuff, but we couldn't believe that she was 70 years, 70 years old. And so it's something to think about. You know, I, I wrote about this on my blog and somebody said, you know, I really feel embarrassed about what I'm teaching my daughter every time I'm coloring my hair. And I was sort of like, man, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Mm. So that's my sort of closing statement. I'll pass it on to these gentlemen, and uh, we can uh, just have an informal discussion. Um, first, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm glad you know that you have a resource here, and that is us. Uh, we will do this again. Uh, this is not just a one-time deal.
More um, than one conversation. Um, and and what, what we'd be interested in, I'll, I'll speak for Bill, is think about some conversations you might have tonight that you wouldn't have had last night based on coming here, and then come back and let us know what's, what's going on and would your questions change? You know, like, what's the next step? I, I got this conversation open. Second, um, be, working in aging is wonderful because it's a way to be selfish and selfless at the same time. Right? We're taking care of our own old age by doing this, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that. <laughs> but we're really trying to change the world in time for us to get there. Um, think about the fact that, that dealing with, with family issues has gotten you conscious of some of these things and start thinking about what you're going to do for you and what you want your children to do. Start educating them. Don't let them grow up with those stereotypes that you won't fit and they'll go, gee, my mom is really odd. She's not like those other old people. What do I do about that? Uh, third, I think um, if there are workplace issues that we, that we are not addressing adequately, we ought to know about that. Because I think that, that, that UMBC's commitment is to add to the quality of your life by virtue of your working here. Am I all right? Okay. Okay. I, I kind of know Valerie's values pretty well. Um, and let us know if we can, you know, if, if we can help you do things better, yeah, we ought to do that because you're a valuable asset. You're a valuable member of this family. Because um, I would like UMBC not only to teach about aging in, in the most unique way, but to do about aging in the most unique way. And that starts with, with you all. So that's all I have to say. And I have one last thing to say. You're all, almost all of you are sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. And I want you to listen to me for a minute. Be kind to yourself, okay? You're doing the best you can. These are hard things. No one has all the answers, okay? Be forgiving of yourself most of all. That's all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you guys you. for coming. <clears throat> Great job, Steve. As always. Yeah. As always. <laughs>